This week's episode is sponsored by Tubi. In the mood for something scary? Maybe something gross? How about an old Stephen King flick? Tubi is your answer. With over 30,000 titles in their never-ending catalog, there's always something for even the hairiest horror fan to sink their teeth into. Be it carnage candy, found footage fair, survival scares, or relentless reality TV, the blood runs thick throughout the halls of Tubi's horror section. Better yet, it's free. That means no subscriptions, no hidden fees, and no ghouls asking for your credit card. It's all there and all for you. So what are you waiting for? Download the Tubi app tonight. If you dare. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, and welcome to the Bloody Disgusting Network. The following show is just horrifying. Beware. You're obsessed with her, and you're obsessed with her daughter! All right, easy, Geraldo. Welcome back to Horror Queers. We're talking Sweets to the Sweet, we're talking Cabrini Green, and we're talking I heard you're looking for Candyman, bitch. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace, and we're talking do 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 Oh doo, my god. Doo, One doo, of my doo, doo, favorite doo, scores. Doo, doo. Yeah, this actually played um at the, uh, so not during our wedding ceremony, but during like the pre-ceremony like happy hour gathering at my wedding. What, you're trying to cue the guests that you're going to kill them? <laughs> no, we found all these really pretty string and piano versions. Well, obviously, this Aww. is already piano. Sorry, we're talking Candyman, everybody. <laughs> but <laughs> there it is. No, no, Ari and I, we found um, like pretty like string quartet and piano versions of like classic horror themes we liked. Nice. And we played that. Basically, when the guests get there before the ceremony starts and they're waiting mm-hmm. for us to walk down the aisle, like that's what was playing. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, it is kind of a romantic melody, particularly mm-hmm. given the context of this film. Yes, yes. But yeah, it's a fucking banger. And I love that it makes um, Philip Glass a bunch of money every year just on residuals. You know, okay, we talked, well, we talked about this a little bit last year when we covered Candyman 2. And listeners, if you haven't listened to the episode on Candyman 2, I'm going to bump it because I think it's a good episode. And of course, Dr. John Paul is a really good guest. Mm. But um, Philip Glass, they repurpose his score for it. But you know, there's that whole story with this movie where they're like, Philip Glass was like tricked into making a horror movie and he called oh, them after right. the movie premiered and was like, you tricked me into doing a horror movie. And I'm like, but <laughs> when, when you're composing, like, don't you have like a big theater screen that you're looking at as you're like composing and recording the music? <laughs> Mysterious. Yeah. Now I want to hear from composers. Folks, is that not the way that you do it? Is it possible that he was actually tricked into doing this? Anyway, Trace introduced yeah. our guest. No, <laughs> so yeah, we can't talk about this movie alone because there's so much to unpack here. So yes, uh, all right, everyone. He is the host of Brother Ghoulish's Tomb, a podcast that offers short stories and horror movie reviews. Please welcome a Brother Ghoulish himself, Ryan Kenny. Ooh, yay! Hey everybody, what's going out? <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? Doing fantastic. I'm doing great. We're here to talk about Candyman, so... Oh, thank you so much for coming on to this, because this is kind of a... I mean, I, I feel like it's a big episode. Also because, I mean, with the exception of maybe Hellraiser, it is Joe's absolute favorite horror film. Absolutely. Yes, this movie is an integral part of my horror origin story. Ooh. So, Ryan, what is your relationship with Candyman? When did you first see this movie? The funny thing is, I don't remember the first time seeing it because it was so just hotly talked about in my family mm-hmm. amongst my friends we were all scared as hell to say candy man five times growing up oh yeah so i don't know it feels like the first time that i actually watched it and consumed it and like paid attention was as an adult and it was watching it with my fiance like we were just checking it out and i'm like wait a minute i don't remember some of these details but what oh, may wow. have happened is i may have like blurred i think some of the sequels and everything together into one big mess because of how right. frequently Candyman was just on, just the pieces of it. So it's, mm. I don't know, it's just a big part of me growing up. Like just people talking about Candyman and my mm. aunts and uncles using it to try to scare us. And 
it was <laughs> it was just always there it was like bloody mary for us right yeah well i mean that's the thing too right because i mean this is based on a clive barker short story called the forbidden and this bloody mary aspect was a film invention this was created by bernard rose when he was writing the script but i mean i say created because yes it really is based on the bloody mary <laughs> myth <laughs> but I didn't grow up with this, and so I just, um, I only knew of this film based on the VHS cover, you know, the I with the B. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, I promise I'm not going to keep plugging the second movie because it's not that good of a movie, but <laughs> it, the cover of that second movie with Kelly Rowan with all the Bs on her, like that, mm -hmm. that for some reason I remember sticking out more. So all I knew about Candyman was that it was Bs. That's all I knew about this. Right. Yeah, which is funny, too, because when you hear Candyman, you don't naturally think of bees. It's not like the movie is called Bee Man or something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a film at convention, right? Because there's no bees in the short story. Uh, there are bees in the short story. There's just no reason for the bees in the short story. Oh, okay. I stand corrected. <laughs> no, I, I, it's really weird. I mean, I, I won't go into this in too much detail because, I mean, the short story really is a good, like, skeleton for this film. Mm -hmm. But it's 43 pages long. Candyman himself appears 35 pages into this short story. And oh, right, wow. no one calls him. No one talks about Candyman. It's all about, like, oh, like, you know, the Helen character is, like, going around. It's set in London, and the characters are not specified as black. Candyman's actually a white man with, like, blonde hair, and he looks jaundiced, apparently. But hmm. she's running around, you know, taking pictures of the graffiti. Like, Anne-Marie tells her there was a murder. And then she talks to someone else in the, in, in the apartment complex. And like, oh, yeah, there was another murder, blah, 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 blah. And it's all about just the idea of, like, oh, like, these residents in rundown living facilities are making up urban legends about murder. Mm -hmm. And so when she tries to figure out if it's real or not, then yes, then Candyman comes out and confronts her in an apartment complex, and he calls himself Candyman. Wow. And then, yeah, the, the ending of the movie is kind of the same as the ending of the novel with the bonfire and everything. But it's more Helen's story. Well, I mean, the movie is, too. But, like, it's <laughs> Candyman is really... <laughs> a thing like there's no obviously there's no slave backstory there's nothing with honey there, there's no reason for him to be called candy man except for the fact that yeah there's the whole thing with the candy and the razors on the ground in one of the apartment complexes and that's kind of it there's not really more information given right which is just part of another urban legend right right yeah so the, the short story is more focused on urban legends in general whereas the film does focus it specifically on this man and his backstory because i think in the book uh, in the short story the the candy man is more of an embodiment of urban legends in general rather than one specific urban legend right i wonder if around the time the short story came out because i remember there was like this fear back in the day that there were people giving out candy on mm -hmm. halloween that had like razor blades and stuff in it it, oh, it, sure. it makes me wonder if maybe that's like a nod to those fears that were happening around that time. I think so. I mean, and that because I mean, we obviously haven't seen Nia DaCosta's new film yet, but that aspect seems to play a part in Candyman's origin story. Right. Yes. And of course, uh, you know, we are doing this episode in part because Nia mm -hmm. DaCosta's film is finally coming out. And we're going to chat about that next week on the Patreon. So uh, just think of it as a bit of a double bill. But Joe, I mean, I, I, I stepped on your toes a bit because this this really is like, I mean, you know, you love this movie. So what? Why? <laughs> what, what, what is your just, just why? why. <laughs> uh, I do. Yes, I really, really love this movie. People have probably heard me talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, you've heard me talk about Hellraiser a lot more frequently than you've heard me talk about this, in part because we've covered two Hellraiser films, but yeah. we've only covered one Candyman film, and it wasn't the good one. So. <laughs> it could have been the third one, so, you know, we, we did dodge oh, a bullet with that. Jesus. Amen to that. <laughs> Do not watch the third one, folks. It is, the climax is a woman trying to run up a hill. Oh, no, I would say watch it, but, like, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Aggressively not good, no. Um, this film, on the other hand... So basically, this is, as I said, part of my horror origin story, because when I first really got into horror was because of my sister. And when she basically broke me in by renting two movies from Blockbuster, and one of them was Hellraiser, and one of them was Candyman. So we had a yes. double bill, which she didn't realize because my sister was not that attuned to it. But obviously, we had this Clive Barker double bill. 
And I realize how much it's actually shaped my taste in horror films. Like, I like these kind of gothic romances. Mm-hmm. I like eloquent villains. I like a little bit of risque kind of sexual innuendo. And yeah, I just find Candyman, like you said, Ryan, it's such a deep, interesting film. There's a lot of different types of readings. And I've actually grown to appreciate the film more over the last like 25 years because I didn't realize like oh helen is kind of a villain i always just thought that she Mm -hmm. was this absolutely gorgeous strawberry blonde you know ooh, she accidentally got her friend killed but she didn't mean to that wasn't her fault now i read it and like jesus christ the white privilege of this fucking woman (laughs) (laughs) so i love that the film has changed and matured as i've gotten older but for me this is still like one of the all-time classics I won't disagree with you, and uh, Joe, so because I gave you such a hard time on our Sorority Row episode, where I pulled some comments that you had said about the film and our article on it, Mm -hmm. I dug up some dirt of my own on myself, because I wrote a brief thing about Candyman about six years ago. This is 2015 on Bloody Disgusting, and I'm not going to mince words, because I I think this is actually very poorly written. (laughs) No, so I, I, I thought it'd be fun to write an article called, Which Horror Movies Do You Hate That Everyone Else Loves? Oh my god, I hate you so much, and you no, haven't even read anything. I, I, I'm embarrassed, I'm embarrassed by this. And it's a listicle, and, and um, the three right. films I had were The Original Haunting, and Suspiria, and Ooh. Candyman. And <laughs> before I continue, I do want to say that I have watched this film a lot more like since I saw this for the first time, and I right. do really, really like it now, and I appreciate it now, but 27-year-old Trace um, was kind of an asshole. <laughs> so, <laughs> what I wrote... Ah, Candyman, how I wanted to love you. Candyman was a movie that I simply saw too late in life. I was 23. I don't know why that's relevant. Um, Had I seen it when I was younger, um, or been old enough to see it when it came out in 1992, maybe I would have more appreciation for it. I actually love the story and script of Candyman. Period. Oh my god. Um, (laughs) It's just, it's a flat out statement. You love the story. (laughs) Something about the execution just didn't work for me. The film feels a lot longer than it actually is, 99 minutes, and it's mostly just watching Helen, Virginia Madsen, walk around and make way too many bad decisions. Just stop investigating. Of course, Philip Glass's score is fantastic, but it can't stop the movie from feeling drawn out and dull. To top things off, Candyman the film and Candyman the character just aren't very scary, which is the worst crime a horror film can commit subjective i know no i i don't i don't agree with anything i wrote but like i was just an asshole (laughs) (laughs) the funny thing is though i will say this it's a mood thing right Mm -hmm. because i'll never forget i use this example sometimes um with my friends when i first tried to listen to and it's going to sound unrelated but i swear i'm bringing it back around (laughs) um (laughs) when i first tried listening to sizza for example i i didn't really like her but then her music crept up on me when I was actually in the mood to receive it. And it was like a completely different experience. And I think a lot of the horror that I've I've had, like that I've seen rather is like that for me, because I've had moments with Candyman like that too, believe it or not. Like when I first started um, rewatching, you know, getting older where I was like, was it just that I was so afraid of him? Cause I was afraid of him, Mm -hmm. but like, was Mm -hmm. it, you know, that I was a child that was super afraid of him. But I just think it's a mood thing. Like if you're not in the mood to watch that, cause it's, it's a very specific type of horror movie. Like, it's slower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of stuff, I think, under the surface that's being touched on. Mm-hmm. And Candyman isn't your typical killer in that he's not, like... Because, I don't know, if you're in the mood for Scream, you watch Candyman, you're going to be blown. I guess that's the yes. easiest way to say it. It's, so, that, that is something. So, because Joe and I were kind of talking back and forth about this last night. Because, you know, Candyman's always lumped in with, oh, it's, like, one of the best slasher films ever made. Blah. And when you hear it described as a slasher, which is exactly what I thought when I was 23 years old watching this movie, I was expecting something like Scream or Friday mm-hmm. the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street. Like something where it's, okay, I'm watching Tony Todd with a hook, hook people. Right. And that isn't what this movie is. This is, no. And I also wasn't really able to appreciate, like, again, the themes in this movie. And I mean, I remember having to Google what housing projects were because I didn't know what they were. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. As as white viewers, so much of this gets lost on you because you just think, oh, this nice white lady should really be careful because those black people look <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> and then you get older and you're like, I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> what am I talking about? If there's been anything, I mean, again, there, there have been plenty of films in this that we covered in this podcast that I saw young that I thought were really boring and that I didn't really mm-hmm. like that much. And I'm like, oh, wow, I was an idiot. I wasn't. Cause it, but it's like what you're saying, Ryan, right? Like, 
if you're going expecting Scream and you watch this, well, yeah, you're that's not what this is. And right. I really do believe that for most films, if you don't like them on a first viewing, I do think it is, or not most films, I'm going to say um, films that you really have certain expectations for going in. Yeah. Yes. You really should watch them a second time at least to watch the movie on its own terms, which is exactly what I did with Candyman. Right. Yeah, and when you think about it, if someone hypes something up a lot, I don't know if you guys are like this too, mm. that boosts it even more because now oh, I'm yes. waiting to be blown away. And it's almost like setting me up to hate the film on the low. Like when some, like when so many people are like, this movie changed mm-hmm. my life. And I'm watching yeah. it like, okay, sis. <laughs> yeah, when, when is that going to happen to me? Oh, it didn't right. happen to me. Well, now I'm disappointed. Yeah, I'd rather people tell me, oh, it's fine, because then I'll go in with like, cool, I think it's going to be okay expectations. And then I'll either like love it or hate it. <laughs> right. right. And I think one of the things, I mean, I came down hard on you, Trace. I've been in this exact same position as you. I feel like we all have, right? Mm. I think we should clarify, too. It doesn't make you stupid or it doesn't make you an idiot if you watch something and you don't like it. Like, sometimes it is a mood piece and you just were not in the right mood. Sometimes a movie just isn't for you. Yeah. You don't have to like everything that other people like. I think the big difference is just, are you going to be the person who actively shits on it? Like, 27 year old trace in the article <laughs> no i mean for sure i mean no like uh, again i say in that, that article again i use article loosely it's a listicle and it's one paragraph about this film but i'm saying oh something just didn't work for me and i don't explain right. what that thing is you know if i was mm-hmm. a better critic back then i would have said oh well this is exactly why it didn't work for me you know yeah like it, in a way you almost need some of that context to understand it but it's also really challenging when you do come in with either false expectations or the hype And for some of our younger listeners, this can be an issue because you hear nothing but praise for the classics, right? From whichever Mm -hmm. decade you're talking about. But it's really difficult, particularly with older films, too, to find an appreciation and be able to situate the film from the time period it came out. Like, to me, this film is iconic because I watched it at a really important time in my life. Mm -hmm. This was a gateway film for me. It's also a very quintessentially early 90s horror film. Like when we talk about its approach to race and privilege, this film, it sets a benchmark in terms of the way we talk about race and horror, but it's also not unproblematic. And I don't think a film like Candyman would ever get made nowadays. Like it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited for this new film, because I think it's going to write a lot of the criticisms that people have of this original, despite the fact that it's a great movie. I agree with you. And I think that's why, not even I think, that is why I was so excited to see Nia DaCosta picking this up and and Mm -hmm. turning the story into Mm -hmm. what it's going to become. Because at this point now, we're starting to see some more information about what's going to be in this this new iteration. And I'm sure we're going to touch on it a little bit maybe today. Like, But it's... It's exciting. It's really, mm-hmm. really exciting what she's going to do. And it feels like she can also at the same time kind of honor the things that we love about the film as it is now. So she's going to, I think, carry a lot of that stuff over mm-hmm. and then try to make it more socially conscious, which is really yes. cool. Well, yeah. and, and Joe, you cued me to this last night as well, but there's a really good special feature interview on the Scream Factory Blue of this. Um, that's not a plug, by the way. I'm just mentioning it. We're not getting paid for this. <laughs> 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 but it's it's with Tanana Reeve Du and Stephen Barnes. But they, they, you know, they say, oh, the Candyman, which they like the movie. They really like the movie. But they're like, oh, this is a movie featuring black faces, but made for white people. Yes. Oh, my God. That line connected with me so strongly. I was like, oh, there's a reason that this movie really works for me and has always worked for me. I am the primary audience. Well, Stephen Barnes says later, you know, where they're like, okay, but because this is a movie, it's about black people. I mean, well, kind of, but <laughs> but it's it's made by white people. You know, Bernard Rose mm-hmm. is a is a white British guy. Yeah, and they go into detail, and this is before Nia Dacosta's film was announced, but how important it is to have um, the minority groups be the decision makers, and even just talking about you know queerness, black, whatever. But how they talk about the reason is that because if you don't, like, you know, you can put like. In Candyman, for instance, you can put black people on the screen, Mm -hmm. that's cool, but if they're not the decision makers, then the black people on the screen are just sock puppets for the majority decision makers that are not part of that minority group. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'd never heard it, like, described that way before, and I was like, oh, shit, like, that's totally right. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I I don't think that this is a bad movie or a dangerous movie in the way that it's confronting its racial issues like i think it's actually trying its very darn best but i also think that this movie could have been done quite a bit better 
from people who are living the experiences that are depicted in the film which is not to say like oh you needed to get somebody from a community housing project to make this movie but i think someone with a greater familiarity of the actual social issues wouldn't have just been like well let's go to cabrini green for three days shoot there and then go back to hollywood and film on a stage (laughs) i do respect that they at least cast a lot of the people that like some of the gang members that they met like in the film like as the actual gang members in the film i mean mm-hmm. maybe that's good maybe that's not i don't know <laughs> 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 uh. so yeah i mean as i said before Candyman is an adaptation of clive barker's 1986 short story the forbidden which is part of his books of blood um if you're like me and you have the big book um which is only the first three volumes uh you have to find this one individually it's separately sold as in the flesh volume five of books of blood Okay. Yeah, I feel like we encountered that issue when we covered that Hulu Books of Blood adaptation too, right? Yeah, because there's six volumes and three of them are in like one book, but then four, five, and six are all separate. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. That impacted Lord of Illusion as well, if I'm not mistaken. It might have. Act- oh, yes, yes, because I don't have one of them. And I think that's in the one that I don't have. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, I've already kind of gone over the differences. But, you know, yeah, this was not a specifically black story. This was set in Liverpool. It was about segregation and the culture of poor urban areas. And there was something else in one of these uh, special features where it was like, but, you know, racism and like the status of race in America is similar to the class system in London. Yes. Maybe not the same, but in the ballpark. Mm -hmm. So for adapting Candyman, writer-director Bernard Rose, a Brit himself, was so shocked by Chicago's quote-unquote dynamic architecture and large amount of prejudice that he decided to change the Liverpool location to Chicago. Assisted by members of the Illinois Film Commission, he scouted locations in Chicago and found Cabrini Green, a housing project notorious for its poor construction, violence, and high robbery rates. Casey Lemons even says in one of those interviews, like, it's that the wrong side of town. You don't even drive by it because it's so dangerous. Mm -hmm. It was also located between high class neighborhoods, meaning that, of course, Helen could feel Cabrini's chaos from a safe apartment not too far away, which when we get to the plot, like, that's a really, really big plot detail. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Ryan, I don't know if you ever, like, read the bloody disgusting comments, but whenever um, someone writes something that uh, talks about the politics of any horror film, people will Mm -hmm. jump in and be like, "Mm, not everything's political, blah, blah, blah. Not everything's (laughs) about race, blah, 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 blah. And I've seen people say that about Candyman and watching this. Oh, my God. I cannot. (laughs) You know what? (laughs) But, like, the scene where she's talking about how her building was meant to be a project and it's not and they sold it as condos. It's like, that is literally, like, what what do you make of this scene? (laughs) I mean, I, I think sometimes, like, when people say stuff like that, it's because maybe they're afraid that stuff that they agree with or stuff that they exhibit, they don't want to be seen as racist or whatever the case may be. Yeah. But I feel like so much of what we go through is unlearning things that we don't realize that we're doing. And yes. a lot of that growth, you know, you have to come into things with curiosity and you also have to be kind of respectful of the person who's saying that they're offended. Because mm-hmm. nine times out of ten, it can open up a dialogue. Like, nothing makes you look douchier than the person <laughs> who that, that you've offended. You say to them, like, well, I'm not racist, so <laughs> you being offended is just you digging or you trying to create a scene. It's like, okay, no. Like, we can actually have a conversation. Mm-hmm. And that can't get there if you have that wall up. I, I mean, I'll say, like... like- Twitter is not the place for that conversation, you know? (laughs) One of the main reasons why it's so hard to have a dialogue is because people are so afraid of being wrong, Mm -hmm. especially being wrong publicly. Like, so, you know, if you say something wrong on Twitter, which, granted, you really shouldn't be saying, like, you should really know what you're saying before you post anything on Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) But, like, if you say something, quote, unquote, wrong, and, you know, you get called out and people are retweeting you, like, I'm not excusing any of the behavior, but it's like, I get why someone will react so defensively, but it's like one of those things where it's like, no one's helping the situation here. No. Well, because it's not a platform that encourages discussion, and it certainly doesn't encourage unlearning, as you mentioned, Ryan. And I think one of the things that Candyman does really well is it lets you wade into those waters and discover them for yourself. So it's still allows us an avenue in which to 
deconstruct like okay well as you said trace like i had to look up what housing projects were well that's Mm -hmm. great that means the movie started you on a bit of that unlearning journey but you also had to be willing to say oh i don't know what that is i should educate myself Oh, I mean, like, I'm showing my privilege there, right? Like, <laughs> I, I, I grew up in the suburbs of Houston, Texas, in a very conservative, upper-middle-class white area. Like, we didn't have projects where I lived. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you did, and you didn't know about them. Entirely possible, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe Houston does it, because I mean, I, I was like 45 minutes away from Houston proper, so like that, it, it, it was that. But yes, entirely possible. Yeah. I mean, I'll never forget the time when I was apartment hunting, and I saw this one really great building, and it had like all this luscious green space, and it looked like it had a really vibrant group of people who were living there. And I asked Brian, my husband, I was like, oh, why can't we get into that building? And he was like, because that's a community like co-op project like you have to meet certain conditions and because we are stupid white wealthy people we don't meet that because <laughs> it's not for us and i was like oh but that building looks super great and he was like yeah just because it's a co-op doesn't mean it's shit like what the fuck is wrong with you oh my god <laughs> Oh my god, we're terrible. Um, so yeah, um, <laughs> obviously, uh, the, the Americanization of the story um, turned Candyman into an interracial love story where um, the residents of Cabrini Green were now victims to the titular killer, which I'm sure we'll talk about a bit, because that's something that has always kind of confused me in this film. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but with this change, Rose wanted to showcase those that are living in the poor neighborhoods as quote-unquote, regular human beings that are trying to get by. And so he tried to avoid tropes that are common in uh, most American uh, American ghetto stories, such as gangs and drugs, which I, I kind mm-hmm. of raised my eyebrow at that, though, because I was like, yeah, but, yeah. like, you have Anne-Marie here, and you have Bernadette, and I guess you have the cop, but, like, you still have the gang in the, bath- the, the bathroom. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think part of the story necessitates certain types of characters because we're entering it through the position of this white lady. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right that the whole reason that you set this movie in the quote unquote ghettos of Chicago is because you also wanted to explore that. And I think that's actually where a lot of the tension in the film comes from is that it's trying to do this one thing, but then it's also replicating a bunch of stereotypes and tropes in terms of like negative depictions of black people in order to do that. So, like, it kind of wants to have it both ways. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's all, even a colorism factor in display because, you, I mean, oh, sure. you know, I love Casey Lemons, but, like, she is a light-skinned black woman and she mm-hmm. is, you know, what, what, what Jenna Malone in Antebellum would say is articulate. But then, right. you know, you have uh, Vanessa E. Williams uh, as the uh, darker-skinned black woman and she's, of course, you know, living in the projects. Mm-hmm. I think that there were places where they tried. Mm-hmm. Because I, one thing that... I agree with the negative depictions of black people that are just so tired in a lot of movies that they just keep rehashing everywhere. But Mm -hmm. one thing I think they tried with and I appreciated was they did try to have some other types of black people along the way that don't necessarily fit those tropes or stereotypes. The piece you said about Casey, though, is actually pretty cool because it is very colorist. You know, of course, Mm -hmm. like with her having, you know, as they would say, fairer skin she would be accepted differently on Mm -hmm. that side of the rails versus the people that are on the other side. And a lot of this stuff happens in media a lot, I think, subconsciously, because you're just watching it and you see the representation, but it takes a little bit of time before you realize who of that representation is getting certain treatment based on how light or dark their skin actually Mm -hmm. is. Yeah, and recognizing my own privilege, I feel like I didn't really acknowledge the discourse or the discussions that were happening around colorism until discussions around Lovecraft country, which was last year. Honestly, it wasn't a term I was familiar with until probably that, but of course, I mean, I mean, not, it's not horror related, but we just saw a huge discourse around in the Heights, which I mean, wow. (laughs) But it's something like, like I, I just didn't grow up with or know about and so i I, i'm still kind of learning from the discourse that i see on twitter or otherwise Mm -hmm. 
one other point is as much as Bernard Rose wanted to tell a different type of story or portray a different kind of character, this does fit very neatly into the narrative that Hollywood was actively producing at the time because this film comes out in 1992, the year before we've got Wes Craven making People Under the Stairs, which previous episode, you can go and listen to that. Mm Mm-hmm. But then we've also got John Singleton's Boys in the Hood in 1991. And then we've got Alan and Albert Hughes uh, with Menace to Society the following year in 1993. So, like, it sounds very facetious to say, but, like, black narratives around criminal enterprises, but Mm -hmm. also gentrification and housing were kind of hot at this moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's true. So yeah, so Rose writes this screenplay, uh, gets a huge amount of attention, um, casting agencies, uh, you know, are going nuts for it, and Madsen and Todd both tried to get parts. Apparently they did want Eddie Murphy for Candyman, but... I can't even (laughs) imagine it. Like, I've seen dramatic performances, but I still cannot imagine it. Have either one of y'all seen Vampire in Brooklyn? Oh, yes. Okay, but do you like it? (laughs) <laughs> um, it's this a, isn't a trap. I promise. I don't like it, but like it's okay if you do. I just, like, I'm just curious. <laughs> it's a fun watch. The reason I love that film is because like I grew up watching it uh, with my family, so it triggers the mm-hmm. feels for me. It's it's uh, just okay. a fun, it's just a fun movie, but it's it's by no means a good movie, and I wouldn't suggest that people <laughs> that people go watch it or anything. But yeah. I watched it for the first time after Craven died because I like went through his entire filmography like to hit on my blind spots, and it was just it was one of those things where I was like, I don't think this movie knows what it wants to be. <laughs> the, the the horror and the comedy are constantly at odds with each other, and when I watched it, I didn't think either one was particularly successful. But again, like I'm watching this again like, later in life. <laughs> mm-hmm. But apparently the reason they didn't want Murphy, um, well, a one was uh, he was too expensive, which I do believe. Yes. The other one was that he was too short at five foot nine compared to to Tony Todd's six foot five. Right. I mean, one of the things that people always talk about is well, there's two things. It's obviously Tony Todd's voice, which is absolutely iconic and gives so much lift to this movie. But yes. Yeah, he is a very imposing figure. Like his introduction is literally just him standing with his hands behind his back, and he looks so powerful, but also very threatening. And I'm trying to imagine it with like a person my height. Mm, it's not quite <laughs> as effective. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with you guys. And it shows everything happens for a reason, because I can't see anyone Mm-mm. but yeah. Tony Todd playing that role. It's immediately recognizable. Yes. And it's subtle. I don't feel like he's someone who's just blasting out of the gates. It's just he has this very strong presence. Mm-hmm. And it's the way that he talks and stands. It's it's every subtle nuance that just makes him Candyman. He yes. is Candyman. Yes. Which is saying something for a character that appears 45 minutes into this film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's such an undeniable presence. Like, sure, we get the voiceover that introduces the film to make sure, like, yeah, he's here. He's over everything. But especially once you've seen the movie and you reflect back on it, the first half of this movie is actually not about his Candyman. It's about the real life Candyman. But he still is there and present and when you think back about the film it's like oh yeah it's tony todd like that's Mm -hmm. what i go to Mm -hmm. yeah and yeah as you said joe you know they they did spend some time on cabrini green they spent three days there um with most other days spent in a hollywood soundstage when they were at cabrini green they had plainclothes law enforcement by their side because i think they said there were like four gangs that were at war with each other at the time Well, the structure of Cabrini Green was basically that, like, a different gang had control of individual towers. So it was constantly, I don't want to say at war with each other, but there was a lot of posturing and, you know, trying to co-opt each other's power. So this is not a situation that you would want to just walk into Mm willy-nilly. Yeah. There was some controversy, at least on the studio side, that the film was depicting racism and racial stereotypes. Um, So the studio asked Bernard Rose to go and have a whole set of meetings with the NAACP because the producers were so worried. And apparently this is what the NAACP said to him. They read the script and they said, why are we even having this meeting? You know, this is just good fun. It's a horror movie. And their argument was, why shouldn't a black actor be a ghost? Why shouldn't a black actor be a Freddy Krueger or Hannibal Lecter? If you're saying that they can't be, it's really perverse. This is a horror movie what do you expect which in a way is laudable i I don't know i mean i feel like 
it's the same conversations we have as queer men, right? Where we say, Mm -hmm. oh, I just don't always want to be the villain. But then when you think about it, there are no other significant... Well, okay, I know that's not 100% true, but at this point, (laughs) it felt like we hadn't had a really significant, like, studio-backed mainstream production where we had an iconic black villain, right? Yeah. I might be wrong. I'm probably no, I mean, wrong. Like, I mean, I'm thinking of Blackula. That's the one that immediately comes to mind, right? And that's like during the exploitation, the black, the black exploitation period. But like yeah. the 90s are when a lot of, because, like, you know, we have, I mean, not a black villain, but like, you know, we have Demon Knight and Tales mm-hmm. from the Hood and Leprechaun in the Hood. Like all this is in the 90s. Yeah. Oh, Leprechaun in the Hood. Why did you do that to us just now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I like the second in the Hood, the Back to the Hood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the superior one. Okay. I agree, but I, I again, young Trey's writing something. I was I was ranking the Leprechaun film for Bloody, <laughs> and I thought that the In the Hood was the worst one. And I was like, I also think it's kind of racist. <laughs> but the director commented on it and like clapped back at me really bad. Oh no! Because <laughs> the director's obviously a black man. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> but it's oh not a good movie. <laughs> oh gosh! That's everything though. That's literally everything. <laughs> I, felt, I saw it was years it was like two years after the article went up too and i was like i just like i don't know why i think it was a i think i was watching one of them just because it was saint patrick's day and i looked at the article and i was like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> i'm always that. afraid of something like that happening like i'm talking about somebody because it's all in good fun like it just because i hate the movie doesn't mean like i'm throwing shade it just wasn't for mm-hmm. me but yeah, yeah I, I feel you <laughs> <laughs> so after after you know get production wraps and they this comes out and joe this actually premiered it had its world premiere at the 1992 toronto international film festival playing as part of its midnight madness lineup mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> would have been a good addition uh it was released on october 16th 1992 so what a couple weeks later it made 5.4 million its opening weekend in the number four spot Beating it was Under Siege in its second weekend, The Last of the Mohicans in its fourth weekend, and The Mighty Ducks in its third weekend. I mean, those films are all big. Right, but here's the thing. Much like with The Fly last week, it managed to kind of hold its own. It moved up to the number three spot in its second weekend and stayed there in its third weekend because that was obviously Halloween weekend. So, like, Uh, okay. Releasing it earlier in October actually helped it because it, it, I guess, people were in the mood for something spooky. Right, yeah. It went on to gross $25.7 million domestically against a production budget of about 8 or $9 million. It was well-received critically. Uh, we're looking at a 76% on Rotten Tomatoes with an average score of 6.6 out of 10, which I thought was a little low. But mm-hmm. in a rarity, over on Letterboxd, we've got a score of 7.2 out of 10. So, you know, those people are smart. Okay. <laughs> Oddly enough, though, audiences gave this film a C-plus cinema score rating, but I Ugh. might attribute that to the fact that the white lady dies. Oh. Uh, maybe. I mean, it's got that nice twist ending where she gets to become Candyman, which I also have thoughts on. But <laughs> yeah, you're not you're not wrong. This isn't this isn't exactly the most upbeat of endings, right? Um, but yeah, all I have left, I mean, just kind of the legacy. Like this, uh, actually, I think the first time I heard about this movie outside of the VHS at Blockbuster, um, it came in at number seventy-five on Bravo's one hundred scariest movie moments. Did y'all watch that when y'all were growing up? No, I didn't. Oh my god, you should really Google it. It was four parts. It was like twenty-five like moments per part. Right. Um, but it was like this event. They did. They played like one episode a night for like a whole week, and it basically. When it aired, I would have been like twelve ish, and I made a list of all of them. I was like, okay, well, these are the movies. <laughs> all I have the movies to go see. you couldn't watch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let me guess. Exorcist was one, right? Um, I think Jaws was number one, actually. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's actually how I found out about Wait Until Dark. Um, was through Bravo's One Hundred Scariest Movie Moments. Oh, nice. Okay. But yeah, I mean, it was uh, Candyman was number eight on Bloody Disgusting's the top thirteen slashers in horror movie history. Tony Todd made number 53 on Retro Crush's The 100 Greatest Horror Movie Performances. And in 2001, the uh, American Film Institute nominated this film for their 100 Years 100 Thrills list, but it did not make the cut. Boo. Yeah, there's a, I, I went to go look it up to see what it was, and there's a lot of non-horror thriller films on the list for some reason. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's, uh, that's Candyman. No, it's not. That's your part of it. No, I wasn't wasn't insinuating that we end the episode. (laughs) 
<laughs> Ryan, he does this to me all the time. He's like, well, my part of talking is now done. <laughs> He's like, so tell everyone where to find you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ryan, thank you so much for coming. It has been a joy and a gift. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to draw on a couple of readings for this. So I'm going to cite L.F. Donaldson, The Suffering Black Male Body and the Threatened White Female Body, Ambiguous Bodies in Candyman, as well as Aviva Briefel and Sian Nagai's How Much Did You Pay for This Place? Fear, Entitlement, and Urban Space in Bernard Rose's Candyman. Ooh. So just keep an ear out for those basically every five minutes or so because <laughs> there's actually a lot of academic reading and writing on this movie maybe that's not surprising at did all, you find they were more recent not a ton i did pull an interesting film days article but i find a lot of people just end up repeating the same things like people want to talk about helen as a bit of a white savior but also as a final girl people want to talk about racism and people want to talk about class as a segregated space I do think we should address, um, and really talk about the white savior thing, white savior thing, the trope as well for, I mean, like, at some point in here, because, I mean, I know we will, mm -hmm. but uh, just because I, I remember, I, I don't know when, how old I was, but I remember hearing the term, and again, went to go Google it, looking it up, and I was, again, in the back of my mind, I was kind of like, well, wait, why is that bad? Like, it's someone helping another person. Like, there's something <laughs> oh, bad about that. Ooh. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that unlearning, right? <laughs> yeah, very much so. I'm going to look so bad in this episode. Oh, my God. It's okay. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> not a, yeah, not at all. <laughs> so one fact I do want to introduce to this, uh, just to kind of set the stage, like we've talked about Cabrini Green as a site of violence, and it was a housing project. It was created in 1955 as part of a large-scale initiative, and it ended up being destroyed only in 2011, after like a lot of time had passed. So it kind of has like a very long sort of dark history. But I think some people are like, well, it also defined for a lot of people what their situation was like. And it gave us a almost like a focal point in which to talk about how the American class system works and so on. But just to give you a primer as to what housing looked like in the 80s, so there was a housing crisis that reached its peak of cruelty under Reagan and Bush administrations. Shocking. <laughs> but from 1977 to 1980, during the Carter administration, the federal government added an average of 290,000 new families each year to the list of those receiving housing assistance. But then when Carter was ousted from the White House in 1980, Reagan slashed that budget. So it went from 30 billion a fiscal year in 1981 to barely 8 billion in Ooh. 1986 and that means that the housing units drop sharply in virtually every city and the reason that that becomes important is not just because it situates where people could afford to live and like what kind of housing people could have but there was like this wave of white panic that if poor black families were suddenly losing their housing situations, then they might start to creep into more <laughs> affluent white neighborhoods. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> white panic. Uh, I mean, that's like, you know, so much of this movie is like, oh, white woman running from black man. Like, oh, the white woman's terrified of the big black man coming to get her. I feel like that is a slightly... Like, one of the, the reasons that I picked the Donaldson article is because it actually refuses to position the relationship between Helen and Candyman as a dichotomy. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't want to say, like, oh, it's a black villain and a white victim. Mm -hmm. It's more like, well, this white victim becomes a villain by the end of the film if you mm -hmm. want to look at it in certain ways and the way that her narcissism and her entitlement allows her to encroach on other spaces actually renders her better than and if you think of Candyman, he's also a victim because yep. of his backstory i mean okay because a big issue that some people have with this film is that yeah this is a tragic figure Candyman, man that is right. what he is yet he's slaughtering the black residents of cabrini green mostly yeah. And in my mind, I'm like, is it maybe more of like a The Grudge type situation where it's like, it's not really, because they don't even give him a name in this movie, right? It's not until the sequel where his name is Daniel Robitaille. Mm-hmm. Okay. I can't remember if it was in this one or not, but yeah, it, yeah. 
in my mind, I read it as, okay, this isn't really Daniel Robitaille. It's like the anger and rage and emotion that it has manifested in the form of this boogeyman of sorts. And, you know, because they, oh, like, you know, his ashes were sprinkled over the the ground that is now Cabrini Green. So, of course, Mm -hmm. he's, like, killing people that are there. That's kind of how I read it. But, I mean, the film doesn't really explain it. (laughs) The way I read it, it's funny that we hit on this point because they also discussed that a bit in Horror Noir as well. And Mm -hmm. it gave me time to sit with it and really think about it from a different perspective for quite some time. Because growing up, I didn't just watch a lot of horror. I also read a lot of horror. And it wasn't uncommon for someone to die or have their remains in a particular place. And then automatically they would just be kind of stuck to that space Mm -hmm. and just haunting that space. And so Candyman haunting Cabrini Green would make sense because of him being killed there. And him actually killing the black residents. I would have preferred to see him killing the white people who actually did this to him or like on the other side of the rails. But at the same token, that's where Nia DaCosta's Candyman really has an interesting position Mm -hmm. coming in because of gentrification. Like a lot of areas that were predominantly black are now switching. And so if there is a haunting that's tied to Cabrini Green and now white folks are moving in, he is going to start killing them. And Mm -hmm. it's it shows how sometimes when you bring in black creators and you take the IP and allow them to just like play with it and do something more with it. Right. It can take it somewhere else and be very creative because I love the standpoint of what people are saying about that. But at the same token, I didn't personally feel that way watching it at first. I just felt like if you called Candyman, he was going to kill you. Most of the black people who were in Cabrini Green knew this. So they weren't, they were, (laughs) they they weren't weren't calling him. (laughs) And it's funny because that's how a lot of the people, in my own family growing up where they didn't, you know, they didn't play with stuff like that. So it was, it was very relatable to someone who just didn't know. And so when Mm -hmm. I got older and I understood what people were saying, I'm like, Oh, I see that perspective too. You know, he should be killing the people who did this to him, but you know, it's just that rage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And that's why it's like, okay, it's not for me again, it's not Daniel himself choosing to do this or doing this period. It's just like, it's, it is this manifestation of him that like takes his shape per se. Well, it's interesting that you say that because the Briefel and Nagai piece, they actually hypothesize that the iteration of Candyman that is played by Tony Todd in the back half of the film is actually a manifestation of Helen's overactive imagination. And it's, it's a reading that when you read the piece, it makes sense, but it's kind of hard to wrap your head around when you just hear it the first time. But basically it kind of explains why she is often presented as being under hypnosis when he speaks to her. Like it's actually her imagining this, like positioning herself as this Gothic heroine who is under the sway of this dark, mysterious man. And she repositions herself as the most important figure in this narrative, which is part of the reason why they think she's like a giant narcissist and stuff. (laughs) I mean, I get that vibe from her too, like narcissist, so it's not like a far stretch. (laughs) Well, it's interesting because she's presented in the film as someone who's in a bit of a liminal state. Like she and Bernadette don't have the authority because they're only writing their thesis. So that's why the scenes with Trevor and Purcell, it's brief, but it's really important that she is not a figure of authority. And ultimately she is trying to desperately prove her academic worth to these men. Hmm the scene where she dresses down Bernadette for like saying, Oh, we look like cops and her being like, why are you trying to scare me? And you're like, this is you deflecting and also trying to dress somebody down that you think is below your position so that you can go into a place that is quote unquote below your position because you're trying to make yourself more important. Mm. I I do empathize with Helen. I I understand like the issues that she has. I think maybe the turning point in the film for this character though is is after she gets assaulted in the bathroom and Bernadette brings her the photos and she's like, oh, like everyone's interested in your thesis now. And, you know, Helen makes that comment about how, you know, oh, like, you know, all these murders are happening in Cabrini Green. No one cares. But a white woman gets assaulted and like, oh, it's mm-hmm. on lockdown now, which I do think it's interesting, too, that the, that the chief of police is a black man. Yeah. But it's like, oh, cool. Um, it really sucks that these murders are happening. But yay, our thesis is having all these people jump on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, like, she does kind of contain multitudes. Like, I applaud the film for giving her that line. 
it's actually a very early acknowledgement of her own privilege, but then she still seeks to capitalize on it, right? Yes. Like she gets super fucking excited. Oh my God, we're going to get published. Oh my God, like this is going to do so much for us. And you're like, oh no, you're, you're like that type of white lady. <laughs> That's exactly what it is, right? And you see this in other spaces too, where there are people of privilege who are really rich. And they're coming and taking pictures of places or filming documentaries in places if they go back and make a lot of money off this thing or get a lot of prestige. Mm -hmm. They're not going to likely come back no. for, and break bread with the people who are still stuck in that state of suffering. And so mm -hmm. in that sense, it's it's something that I can see people making the mistake of. I, I can actually see it not being something of ill intent where, oh, wow, look at this, you know, and then taking mm -hmm. that suffering essentially and then capitalizing on it and just leaving all those people behind. And it makes you kind of wonder about the type of person underneath because there are other ways to generate revenue or develop platforms or, you know, opportunities for people because of what you did. And then going back and sharing that wealth or creating an opportunity or opening the door for somebody else. I feel like I, I feel like I kind of went off I went to a tangent a little bit. No, but... <laughs> no, no I, I totally see what you're meaning. Okay. Though. Like there's there's opportunities for people to lift up marginalized groups if they stand to make a profit off of them. But oftentimes they don't. And that's very telling. Right. I do think one of the interesting moments in this film and Trace, you kind of cued it, is that the police detective is a black man and he makes a big deal out of Helen's injury. Like he almost gets excited because finally he's not going to have to rely on members of the community to turn on one another. He's got this rich white lady, you know, he, he can trot her out and say, hey, we're doing something about this because she's quote unquote more reliable, quote unquote more believable. And also she stands to lose nothing if she tattles against the Candyman figure who hits her in the bathroom. Mm hmm. So he's also looking to profit off of this because it'll look yeah. good for him that he's finally doing something about the quote unquote gang situation in Cabrini Green. His response to her when she asked about she goes, what about the little boy? And he goes, well, we don't need him. We have you. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> you're white <laughs> and you're a woman. <laughs> yeah. It really speaks to the kind of value and importance that we play on certain types of bodies. And that's one of the interesting relationships that this film is doing a good job of exploring you know again i think if we were being told somebody else's story there might have been more or different opportunities to explore this and maybe take it further but that's not the film that we get right, right. so we can only do what we can with what we're presented but i like that the film is making those kinds of efforts to say yeah we acknowledge that people look at helen and they respect her whiteness and her affluence and the fact that she dresses nicely and her hair is always perfectly permed uh you know <laughs> when bernadette dies we literally don't fucking say her name again yeah she she is unceremoniously killed from this movie. Although I do, and I normally don't say this about horror films, but I do applaud that it's an off-screen kill. This movie, it's really aftermath scenes, right? Like the dog's yeah. decapitated head, Bernadette's body, which we see for a split second. Mm -hmm. It's not the gore fest that you think it's going to be, or at least that I thought it was going to be. No, I, I always used to say it was classy. <laughs> oh, was that your elevated horror back in the 90s? <laughs> kind of. I mean... <laughs> It's part of the reason why I like Hellraiser and Candyman is they still have the gore. They still have the practical effects like that introductory shot of Tony Todd with the hook and his hand. And you can see mm -hmm. the, oh, the serrated stump. flesh. Yeah, it's gross and gory. But so much of this film is also exquisitely beautiful. And for me, it feels mature. And not just because it doesn't have, you know, teens in the suburbs getting chased, but <laughs> it, it feels like it has a lot more on its mind. And I applaud it for trying. Yeah, just giving us <laughs> horror that's a little bit different because this was coming out of the 80s where it was a lot of the same kinds of films. I agree 100 percent. And I know that you're saying it's not just because of the teenage suburb thing. Uh, you know, I feel like that is a piece of it. And it's not even shade because I'd love, you know, a good teenage in a suburb oh, 90s we and 80s. all do. Yes. <laughs> but at the same token, this movie marches to the beat of its own drum. And it's almost refreshing in that way. Mm -hmm. 
And I do find it interesting. I mean, I don't really know how much of a part this would have played, but like Clive Barker was very hands off with this movie. This really was Bernard Rose's baby. And I can't help but wonder what this would have looked like if it would have been any different. If Clive Barker, like, I don't know, did more with it. Would have been more sexy, I think. (laughs) Oh, I do think it is sexy. But, you know, the closest we get to an unconvincing sex scene is like anything to do with Trevor. And he's nasty, obviously. And then we get like the threat of a black man raping a white woman when she succumbs to Candyman in his lair. And it's like somewhere between a rape scene and a distorted religious wedding because they're kind of doing it on an altar. And that's kind of his church. Yeah, I would actually also view um, Trevor's death as kind of a pseudo sex scene because she is. Oh, yes. Yes. Moaning and like, uh, 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 Mm -hmm. uh, kill, kill, kill. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, no. That that is a hundred percent a sex scene. <laughs> <laughs> Want the high stakes stuff? The believe the hype stuff? The criminally good, emotional roller coaster, can't believe what you're seeing stuff? You know, the good stuff. AMC Plus has it all. Can't wait for the beginning of the end? Watch all new episodes of The Walking Dead one week early. Want to be chilled to the core? Set sail with the North Water, a thrilling Arctic drama starring Jack O'Connell and Colin Farrell. Plus, uncover gripping true crime content ad-free and on demand. Expect the epic with AMC Plus. Sign up today at amcplus.com. AMC Plus, only the good stuff. Okay, so... Important to note that this film opens with a bird's eye view of the highway. And we get a lot of these transition scenes. And for me, as a young viewer, this was one of the most striking elements because they're almost always accompanied by Philip Glass's score. So instantly iconic. But I think it's really important to acknowledge that the film is visually cueing us to take note of the fact that they're actually not that far between Helen's apartment. Like I think at one point she tells Bernadette it's an eight minute drive. So the distance between the two locations is not very far. And yet because of what we learn about Cabrini Green, that distance also feels completely immovable and impassable. Like if you are of a certain social class or your skin is of a certain color, you are not getting on the other side of that highway. Yes, and and um, Joe, I'll give you credit for this because you sent me this article last night. But <laughs> but um, th- this is Candyman: A Survey of America's Historical Aversion to Urban Blackness by Peyton Robinson. And Peyton writes, um, you know, as Helen researches the history of Cabrini Green, she uncovers that its layout is identical to her own condo. Her mm-hmm. apartment building was erected with the intention of being a housing project until the city discovered that nothing would separate it from Chicago's Gold Coast. So it was modified into condos. Then Cabrini Green was built so that the ghetto would be physically cut off from the rest of Chicago by the L train and the highway. The Mm -hmm. verity of de facto segregation's persistence is another thematic inclusion within the lore of the film, gentrification. The city's skyline is a backdrop to Cabrini Green as the project has been deliberately pushed to the outskirts. Black poverty is treated as an eyesore, shoved just outside the peripherals of Chicago's line of sight. It's blatant racial and economic evasion at the institutional level, furthering America's history of imperialism and displacement of people of color. So, sorry, yeah. I think that's linked into like what, what the opening credits are doing. <laughs> <laughs> it successfully gives me that feeling. And like you were saying, Joe, it's one of the more striking things I carry with me from this film. And with Philip Glass's score, everything is just, it's perfect. And it conveys that message well. So... Mm-hmm. I like it. Agreed. Yeah. I do love that the film initially opens by saying, like, we're going to tell you three different versions of the same story, and we want you to pay attention to how it shifts, right? So we hear the white couple, and of course we get our uh, little cameo there by... uh, Ted Raimi. Ted Raimi. (laughs) (laughs) This could be urban legend from 1998, right? Where it's Mm -hmm. like, oh, it's a couple of white kids, and they do this thing, and we hear Trevor tell it again in his... uh, Well... (laughs) In his class. All the people that decry that there's an urban legends class in urban legend. Okay, come Mm -hmm. to Candyman. (laughs) There you go. Candyman did it six years earlier. (laughs) It's important that we hear this from 
white people first in the film. And we get this great knowing wink between uh, Bernadette and Helen where they're just kind of like, oh my God, these stupid idiots keep falling for this dumb Candyman legend. And yes, Mm -hmm. it, it builds up a healthy note of skepticism. It introduces them as academics. But I think it's also very much like, yeah, what are white kids in the suburbs afraid of? Or what are these like dumb white kids at this University of Illinois think? And it's like, oh, yeah, saying something five times in the mirror. That's scary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, try living in the fucking housing projects. That's <laughs> scary. Or at yeah. least that's what this film posits. <laughs> but I think one of the things that's really interesting is that when they actually do get to Cabrini Green, so they, they hear the story a second time from these two women, and it immediately then gets tied to an actual murder. I love that Helen's privilege peeks through when she says like, oh, was this woman shot? And you're just like, okay, Helen, there is a lot of crime in Cabrini Green. There is a lot of gangs. But like her default assumption is like, oh, a black person died. Were they shot? Uh, fucking hell. <laughs> I didn't even think about it. I didn't did either. <laughs> That's actually pretty hilarious. I think about it all the time because my dad constantly is like, oh, so have you had any gangs shooting each other in Toronto lately? And I'm just like, dad, you were so fucking racist. Like, no, I mean, I, I think I've talked about this in the podcast before, but like, love my parents and I hope they never listen to this because they would kill me. <laughs> but... My parents grew up in Louisiana. My mom grew up in Mandeville, a tiny town outside of New Orleans, but like New Orleans was like a 30 minute drive away. My dad grew up in a place called Delhi, which is right outside of a, a, the city of Monroe, but it is like Podunk, the city, like, or like the town. Okay. So I would never call my parents racist, but they definitely have certain ideals <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and ideas in their head based on growing up in Podunk, Louisiana in the 60s and 70s. That they're still kind of working out, but I definitely, like, there were things, like, like what you just said, Joe, about, oh, like, yeah, like, what your dad is saying. I definitely grew up, like, hearing a lot of things from my parents about, like, oh, like, well, this is what black people do. This is what black people do. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it becomes really important in the case of Candyman because... Part of this is all about how stories propagate and turn into something like legends, right? So Mm -hmm. in the case of the gangs who adopt the Candyman moniker, they're doing so because it has a kind of power, right? Like it's a cultural cachet to be able to wield this fake ass hook and say, yeah, I'm the Candyman bitch, because it grants them power over disenfranchised people. Mm. But in Helen's case... She's literally just accruing stories and collecting knowledge about Candyman so that she can earn a degree and become a successful academic. Like, we're immediately privileging different types of power, but they're both oral and they're both about telling stories. Well, because it's not really at the expense of the community she's writing about, but she's not doing anything to help the community she's writing about. Yeah. 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 Particularly when she hears the story from the cleaning women, and then she's like, oh, cool, tell me everything. And she looks at it as, oh, this is a novel hook. I'm going to go and get the scoop on these male colleagues who think that they know the whole story. Mm -hmm. What was fascinating about that scene for me as well, and I'm sure you guys saw this when you were doing your research, like, what happened to that woman in the movie you know it's it's based on a true story you know yeah Yeah. like and her name is actually referenced clean in the film in in, in several spaces because her real name was ruthie mccoy Mm -hmm. and this idea of like mirrors tearing away into other apartments Mm -hmm. was something that was really big at the abbott homes and so while we're all watching the movie and we're thinking wow this is really something wild you know this actually did happen and they didn't find her body till two days later Mm -hmm. and it also kind of shows how when black people are going through certain things they're not believed or there isn't like quick enough response time because she did call the police but they did they just totally did not believe her and even when the neighbors called and reported hearing gunshots from inside of her apartment they just didn't they didn't come Mm -hmm. vanessa williams's character is amory mccoy so i wonder if that was like a I don't know, a tribute Uh, of sorts? I wondered because me personally, I think it was a little because the the victim inside Candyman who died by similar circumstances, her first Mm -hmm. name was also uh, Ruthie. I thought that was a little disrespectful. They could have changed the name, maybe Mm -hmm. even the story a bit just to be respectful to the deceased. But um, like you said with the McCoy, I think it's kind of interesting because maybe since 
I'm going to mess up his name. Yaya. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You're, the, the, the lead guy in the new film from Watchmen. He is also a McCoy. And so is Vanessa Williams' character, a McCoy. And so it's almost like the filmmakers are acknowledging that a lot of the themes that are being talked about in the film are actually pulling from something that that's going on in the black community or has right. happened. And that's on step with that iconic set of vignettes that were released for that Candyman shadow puppet commercial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How so many of those were nods to actual things that had happened. So it's penetrating the veil of the film and talking about things that are going on in real life in a safe and respectful uh, uh, space. Hmm. Right. It's oddly confronting. I never really know how to feel when horror films are quote unquote based on a real story because we're so used to seeing things like the conjuring where it's like cool we cast two super hot you know (laughs) generic actors to recreate things that people did in real life but they were actually horrible but we're going to paint over that for the sake (laughs) of hollywood profit um okay i I love that you're referring to patrick wilson and vera farming as generic actors (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I always say like generic beautiful people because it's right. like, no, no, no. they're stunningly gorgeous, but also in like the blandest kind of way possible. Right. But, but or, or like, I mean, again, for a, a different example, like the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is inspired by a true yeah. story, not based on because inspired means I heard about a murder and I wrote about it, but it's <laughs> totally different. Um, <laughs> this is, but again, it's a good marketing technique, right? It is. it is absolutely but like you don't see Candyman saying oh it's based on a true story mm. whereas in this case we know explicitly like it's not hard to track down this information right. and be like oh they're using this actual murder victim's real name yikes okay so let's talk about these opening scenes as they first arrive in cabrini green and mm. the, the thing that i was trying to get to and never quite got there was that this depiction will you know, obviously they filmed there for a couple of days. Uh, the mock-ups actually do look similar. Like there were issues with people who would move out and then their units would get robbed or vandalized and then no one would repair them. They would just kind of like plaster over it or just leave them vacant. There were issues with sanitation departments not coming regularly enough. There's one kind of infamous story that it got so bad in one of the buildings that the garbage backed up up the garbage chute 15 floors oh my god so i think they try to capture that feel in the film like this this doesn't look like a very welcoming place the people are not they are not rich they are living paycheck to paycheck you know i think Anne marie when she's introduced she says like i'm just trying to make a better life but also she can't afford to live anywhere else so this is her circumstance but the weird thing in the film is that you never get the sense that there's actually people who live in this apartment building. Like, until we see the bonfire at the end, you get a sense that there's a couple of people. It's almost like a ghost town. And the reality is, is that there was like tens of thousands of people living in this one very tiny place in a couple mm. of buildings. Jesus. Wow. But I do like everything where they immediately get pegged as cops by these kids when they first come in because they are dressed conservatively and i'm using air quotes <laughs> <laughs> and of course this is more sort of proof that helen is she so hungry for this kind of story that she's not really paying attention to her surroundings and i like that she just attacks everything with this camera right like she sees the graffiti on the wall that says sweets for the sweet and she says oh my god i gotta take a picture not like hmm should i be reconsidering whether this is a good environment for me or if i should even be taking pictures without people's permission like <laughs> there is that iconic shot of her crawling through the wall oh, that. and it's Candyman's mouth and that to me is very Clive Barkery. It's very sexual. That's that's in the book. That is very much in the book. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, specifically her crawling out of the hole. Like they describe and it's painted the same way where it's like the eyes are so close to the mouth, so it looks like he's like leaning his head back. It's all there. Like that, that's basically like how the book starts. Oh, cool. Yeah, I watched the feature out on the disc that the production designer of the film talked about like her process and how they did it. And apparently they actually had a bunch of like really well-known street artists come in and do all of the Candyman oh. paintings. And then they had to age them so that they look like they had been there forever. Shit. That's so cool. And it, mm-hmm. it paid off. Yeah. It's stunning in its kind of like, I don't want to say decrepitness, but like in its, <laughs> uh, 
Just the way it's, it looks like it's gone to seed. It's fallen into disrepair. Yeah, it's it's like when you were like doing a paper that you had like that you had to like dip in tea when you were in elementary school and like yep. crinkle it up and dip it in tea to make it look old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this diary was from the eighteen sixties. <laughs> oh yes. Oh, I think it was a diary. You had to like write a di- diary from someone in colonial times. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan's just like this is the whitest white no. person shit I have ever heard. We definitely had to do the dec- write the Declaration of Independence and like yeah, dip it in tea, crinkle it up, and then burn the edges. Yes, of course you had to burn the edges. <laughs> Maybe shove it in the stove for a couple of minutes, right, just to get that kind of crispiness to the paper. Oh my God, I hated those kind of products so much. I was like, Mom, please do it, like six year old Trace. <laughs> yeah, it's the it's the drama of all that for me that's giving me life. I mean, mm. as a kid, I would have loved that because um, I used to love just playing around with the way the paper looked. I used to like like messing with codes, like putting. I don't know if you've ever done like the lemon uh, juice code and all that stuff. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so that that was my bag. <laughs> oh, I, I what, a lemon juice code. Yeah, so it's like you're hiding text in plain sight. So you're you're putting. Oh, yeah, it was okay. really cool, and you can only see it if you put it up against the light. I used to like yeah. stuff like that, and the I think the Caesar cipher, and I just used to like codes. It, it was gotcha. really really fun for me. Oh, that's fun. Mm. So what you're saying is we should take you to an escape room because he'd probably be really good at it. <laughs> so okay, <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me let me say this about that. I've never done an escape room, and what? I'm only most recently thinking about doing one. Okay. The only reason I didn't do it was in D.C., because I live really, really close to D.C., and so they've been around here for like a long time. Mm-hmm. I used to read this paper. I actually used to re- read a few papers that would have this ad of this guy in a suit climbing up through the shaft of the, I don't even know what it was, like the ceiling, and I'm not fit. So I'm like I'm if I get inside of a room and if like I have they to climb mm. <laughs> if I have to climb out of the room and I'm like are they not going to let me out I have like really bad anxiety so I'm like yeah I don't think I can do this I just talk myself out of it I don't do haunts I don't do like <laughs> I don't play Resident Evil like I can't do none of this Oh my god <laughs> I'll play Resident Evil but I mean I'll, I'll I'll like watch you play I'll like walk you through it it'll be so fun <laughs> You can blame Bobby for me not finishing cuz I started Village <laughs> because of him i bought this game because of him so i'm literally playing it and i'm so scared i'm sweating and like i have like the lights out in the house and i'm talking to him and he's like okay so you killed the second sister right i was like yeah he's like oh my god wait till you see later in the game it's so scary i was like Uh... how scary are we talking he's like oh it makes this look like nothing that night i stopped playing because i I could not imagine anything scarier than Demetress. she is so frightening so I promise that we'll all in this tangent soon. <laughs> so I know what he's talking about. He's talking about the second house, which has, you can watch a video on YouTube. And it's fu- it's one of the scariest things I've ever played in any video game ever. Oh my God, you're not helping. Not but, helping. But, 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 but. Here, here's the thing. It is the shortest segment in the game. Like you can beat it in like 30 minutes. And after that moment, the game kind of stops being a horror game and becomes more of an action game. So if you can make it past that 30 minute segment, um, you're fine. And just watch a video and do it <laughs> okay i i can i can consider doing it and i'm going to have to get loaded and call bobby back and be like just stay on the phone with me please <laughs> yeah like he put you in this position he should have to walk you through it. <laughs> exactly i'll send you the video of what it is and you can watch it and see if it's like something you can handle doing yourself i actually really appreciate that because i paid money for this game and my fiance <laughs> isn't playing it so i've wasted all this money <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, so okay, back to so Candyman. <laughs> back to this movie. <laughs> Don't even know how I'm going to edit that. It's fine. <laughs> okay, so what do we think of this dinner sequence where the girls meet up with Trevor and Professor Purcell, who is played by Michael Culkin, who we will see get murdered in the opening <laughs> scene of the second film? Also, I mean, you know, we haven't really mentioned the queer connection besides Clive Barker, but the actor playing Purcell is a gay man. Mm -hmm. All I could pay attention to was all the cigarettes. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So much smoking indoors in this movie. It was it was definitely a chimney in there, but (laughs) it was definitely a movie of the times. Uh, I'll say that. (laughs) I mean, this scene, I mean, it's a bunch of white academics just one-upping each other over their knowledge of black culture 
But this is also where we get the backstory, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 So this was invented, and I think I read somewhere that Tony Todd actually came up with this himself. It was in a Fangoria article that, like, from 1992, so I couldn't find it online, but like, it was referenced in the footnotes on Wikipedia. Mm. The backstory is horrific. Yeah, because mm-hmm. one of the reasons that I thought it was important to acknowledge is because this recontextualizes what we think we know of this boogeyman. Right. And I'm surprised we haven't actually brought it up. <laughs> this gives it a kind of Freddy Krueger-esque vibe to me. And I mm. always ended up confusing it because I was like, oh, well, this movie came after all of these Nightmare on Elm Street movies. Are they just doing like a kind of Black Freddy? Which, again, saying that out loud makes me sound like such a fucking idiot. No, the NAACP said it, so I think you're fine. (laughs) Well, it's this idea that it's a creature or like a a myth that feeds on a collective consciousness, right? Like Freddy needs the residents of Elm Street to become powerful, but he feeds on their dreams and nightmares. Whereas Candyman feeds on people's belief in him. And well, and that's why he goes for Helen, right? Because by mm-hmm. fingering the uh, the the guy pretending to be Candyman, now everyone's like, "Oh, it's fine. That's yes. the real Candyman." And so, yeah, he's like, "Well, bitch, like I'm going to take you." But I also think that this is such a more sympathetic backstory. Like, not only because Candyman is not a child murderer slash rapist, yeah. but this paints him as a tragic figure, and it introduces the love story component that the films end up really taking to the nth degree in the sequels. But in this case, it's like, you start to wonder, is he even a bad person as a result of this? But I think that's where what we were talking about earlier, right? With like, what is tony todd's version of Candyman, right like is it actually daniel robitaille is it some entity Mm -hmm. i like the tragedy backstory i think it's good that the the first film of the franchise starts with that because you have so many people that are like i don't want to be sympathetic towards my horror movie killer blah 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 right i don't even mind the love story aspect one thing i don't love and maybe you'll disagree is the whole helen kind of looks like the woman that he was in love with i don't love that and like it's something that that francis ford coppola's dracula did the same exact year this came out oh every mm. single time i see the <laughs> reincarnated lover thing yes it turns me off yeah. like one time okay two times all right three times like please it kind of makes the killer look ridiculous to me yeah. a little bit desperate and yeah desperate exactly there's so many more important things going on. And what's really interesting about this scene specifically is it's also a pivotal point for her character development because when everything first started with Helen, I noticed how she would kind of smile doing research on Candyman. So there was mm-hmm. like this little morbid fascination. Yes. And it changed at this dinner and understandably so. I felt like that was handled correctly. This is the point where she starts questioning that fascination and actually starting to feel you know bad for Candyman or feeling bad for other people other than herself in certain capacities there's other ways that she doesn't over time right. but it was a it was a turning point so i would have been more interested in Candyman taking a fascination in her just because she was fascinated because right. like yeah. you guys are talking about with how the collective consciousness is keeping an entity alive i got the same freddy vibes that is exactly who freddy is And it's really drawing from how urban legends, you know, exist in the suburbs, just generally speaking. And they even kind of do a nice nod to it or a setup when she sneaks into Trevor's lecture at the beginning. And he's saying, you know, that these are unconscious reflections of the fears of urban society. Like a lot of the stuff that we hear about with the two teens that go out to the valley and then there's someone hanging over top of the car. It's really Mm. fear of you know teenagers not being abstinent or like engaging in sex so they're trying to scare kids into doing the right thing and as long as that fear stays alive the parents will keep telling the stories so as a result the phantasm lives on through that (laughs) so it's 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 a natural thing and of course you know Candyman being like oh i'm gonna get her nice and good because she's so fascinated works by itself without it becoming the black guy killing all these people for a white woman like that's so tired well, yeah. and I think that's where the adaptation, because again, you know, in the novella, the short story, like, he has no backstory. He is just the embodiment of these urban legends, of some boogeyman that people are talking about, again, with, without a name. 
and I think though that when you add the backstory, I think I think again it could have just been like one or two more like kind of run throughs. Like cool, like you know we're gonna make him this this ex slave who um, slept with a white woman and and uh, all this stuff happened to him. And it, it's one of those things where it's like okay maybe do another pass through to like adjust it from just oh general urban legend boogeyman to specifically like black slave boogeyman you know. Uh, it, it's tricky, right? Because this is where the film starts to get into a little bit of trouble. And I think particularly from its black audiences where it's like, so, okay, he was killed for racist, outdated points of view, right? right? Like he fell in love with the wrong woman, quote unquote, and intolerant people didn't like it. So he was killed. And you're like, cool. But the problem is, is that because this is Helen's story and we see her falling, like quite literally she is hypnotized by him. Right. Like the lighting is constantly just reinforcing that you get like almost a, like a bar over her eyes. And if you read the Wikipedia, it says that they actually practiced hypnotizing Virginia Madsen to get this effect in her performance. I believe it. (laughs) Okay. So they did. And apparently one day she actually like forgot a lot of the day of shooting and after that, she told Bernard Rose, I can't do that again. <laughs> I'm just like, that is too method for me. <laughs> well, but but, that, but that's like when, when you see her, whenever her and Candyman are in the same scene, like not, not when she's like strapped on a chair, but mm-hmm. like in the parking garage, uh, before Bernadette dies, uh, yes. before, when the bees are, she looks hypnotized because she is hypnotized. <laughs> yeah, which I, I kind of love. I mean, I, I don't love the real life stuff because that sounds a little bit terrifying but in the film i think it actually really works but it also then feeds into these particular ideas that like the horror of this film is that this black man is going after this vulnerable white lady yes and i'm just like ah fuck okay now we're back into some bad territory Uh, but that i mean again like you have a bunch of white people making this movie and the funny thing about it is like I've talked nothing but trash about her this entire time, but <laughs> I like Helen nonetheless, even though she is oh, a short sure. character. Like she, like I feel like she's entertaining, and so um, it, <laughs> I was trying not to be shady, but I guess it came out. I guess it came out the way it the, came out. The but, choice of words, <laughs> hmm, right? But, she's entertaining. She is like I. I like seeing her kind of. She's like the plucky investigator, like going into yeah. yeah so oh, she a hundred percent is yeah. And so it's kind of sad that they don't kind of utilize it a little differently. I guess that's the the safest way to kind of say it. Mm -hmm. I mentioned it earlier that I feel like the film has two distinct parts, right? So we've got all of this Candyman myth investigation. Oh, the revelation that no, this is actually just some petty crime guy who whacks her in the face in the bathroom. It's a great scene. Like, I actually think it's all well done it's very terrifying for you know proper white people no no that's it right and that's where the whole like oh this movie's made for white people because the horror of the bathroom scene Mm -hmm. is that yeah she's a white woman alone in this derelict bathroom with a bunch of black men surrounding her yes and a toilet full of poop and bees (laughs) yeah oh my dude this shit on the walls i was like (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Me too. Me too. It's, it's very nasty. So you can smell that bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is some truck stop nonsense right there. It's like, because th- the, the sweets <laughs> to the sweet is written on the wall in shit. Yeah. And it's like chunky. It's not just like smeared. It's like someone had handfuls of shit and molded the words on the wall. <laughs> yeah. That is chunky peanut butter. That is not smooth. <laughs> I have... I, I, And then once, you know, yeah, she she meets up with this police detective and he realizes, cool, I've got this case wrapped up. And we do the funny lineup. I, I laugh every time we have to watch these gentlemen <laughs> step forward and deliver the line about looking for Candyman, bitch. That basically signals the end of what Briefel and Nagai say. It's the end of the social realism and a shift into the supernatural. Because this is where we actually get mm-hmm. Candyman as played by Tony Todd appearing. So g- genuine question, because I don't know the answer to this. How do they do those police lineups? Like, is it like they pull five guys that they've arrested in the past, like, month to be like, oh, is it this guy? Or is it like they pull the guy they think it is and put, like, four randos next to him? So what they do is they get a description. I'm using air quotes. Okay. They <laughs> accost, um, <laughs> like, four or five innocent black guys. One yeah. guy that may possibly <laughs> be 
the person because they think that we all look alike. They tell oh, sure. us to stand next to each other and then repeat the line. But Ugh. the reality is it's a funny scene for two reasons. Like you guys said, like just having them step up, say one by one, it was it was kind of funny. But then also for me personally, growing up, there was always this joke with my family and friends that like when a black person calls the police, it's like it takes forever if they ever mm-hmm. come. But with mm-hmm. a white person, it's like it's like instant. Oh, and yes. they even joke around about it. I think on Scary Movie, she puts white woman in trouble and they're there like <laughs> instantly. <Yes. laughs> so when- <laughs> On the radio, it's like we got a white woman in trouble. <laughs> Oh, yeah, they did put that in there. Like, you could actually hear them saying it. Yeah. I mean, we're laughing because it's fucking terrible, but it's like, yeah, the comedy stems from truth, right? No, I'm laughing because in this scene, at the end of it, like, after everything happens to her, they literally cut scenes to the lineup. You don't see them call the police or anything. So me and uh, my fiance were like, yep, you know, she she got, it definitely works that fast for them. Mm -hmm. Like, Okay, wouldn't it have been... I'm not going to say funny, but to see her give the description of the man that accosted her. Yes. Black man with a hook. Yeah. What would she have said? (laughs) Wearing the coat from uh, Dynasty, the Dominique Devereaux war. Oh my God. I'm sorry. (laughs) I I apologize. I don't get outside often. I think you just endeared yourself to a whole new subset of people. (laughs) And he knows Dynasty. Yes. (laughs) So this is where we shift the structure of the film. So I actually find even like the way it's directed and edited Mm -hmm. starts to change. So it becomes a little bit faster. It's a little bit more dreamy in parts. I also feel that this is where Helen, I mean, obviously her character shifts and she becomes like a criminal who's on the run. And I feel like part of the glee stems from, well, she didn't take it seriously and she didn't understand what she was getting herself into. And now look, she's being handled by a lot of people the way that the black community probably gets handled. Like, Oh, you're not being taken seriously. Yes. We think that you're crazy. Yes. We're going to lock you up. No, we're not going to give you the benefit of a phone call. We're going to uncomfortably ask you to strip. Um, Okay, this scene is the scariest one in the movie to me. Uh, <laughs> there's something about the police booking. Like, I don't know if y'all watch the show Shameless, but there's actually, um, in season four, Emmy Rossum's character, like, she leaves out cocaine because she's on a bender, and um, her, like, five-year-old, like, half-brother snorts the cocaine, and she has to go to jail, oh, rightfully God. so. But the booking scene is, like, a ten-minute sequence. It feels like ten minutes. It's really long, but it's, like, horrifying. And watching Virginia Madsen, because I don't really like oh, the, nobody believes the protagonist, they think she's crazy, um, narratives that much. I don't mind it in this film because of what you just said, Joe. How it's kind of mirroring, in a way, the Black experience. But this scene of her undressing and crying and sobbing as this woman cop just stares at her, it's so supremely uncomfortable. I can't even describe it. Yeah, it is. I think it just reinforces how dehumanizing the criminal justice system can be when you are on the wrong side of it, right? I do love that we have encounters with the police detective where he's so supportive and he's excited because he thinks he's got this case in the bag with her. And then the next time we see him after she has basically taken a meat cleaver to Anne-Marie and the baby is missing and the dog's head and there's blood everywhere in that apartment... He has no sympathy for her. He's not interested in hearing what she has to say. He basically says, we discovered you with a weapon in your hand. You had attacked this woman. You're fucking going to jail, bitch. And the baby's missing. Yeah, and the baby's missing. Fun fact, by the way, uh, this cop is played by Rusty Schwimmer, um, who is a kind of a character actress, but she does play Helen Hunt's mom in Twister. But uh, she is, in real life, Virginia Madsen's best friend. Oh, Oh, okay. I like that. (laughs) (laughs) They went to high school together. Yeah, because that would have been an uncomfortable scene. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I do also love that, like, throughout all of this, it's not even coded that Trevor is cheating on her with this uh, graduate student, Stacy. But Mm -hmm. the moment when she finally gets her phone call, Helen does, and she calls, and it's like 3 a.m., and she gets the answering machine, and you're just like, Oh, it's because he's out fucking that girl. So that's kind of an invention of the film, too. So, A, the whole, like, oh, like, Helen's frame for murder thing, that's obviously the film. It's not in the book. But Mm -hmm. in the short story, she's still married to Trevor, and he's still an asshole. 
But they seem to have an open relationship. Like, she acknowledges that he's leaving to go sleep with another woman. And she seems irked by it, but it's not like a thing. Like, it's not a plot point. So he's already presented as an asshole in general, but not because he's sleeping with other women. Just because he is an asshole. (laughs) And I wonder if that's, like, the British uh, sensibility. Uh, or the American adaptation sensibility. Yeah. Like, yes. oh, an open <laughs> relationship. This is not going to fly. Yeah. And you can still <laughs> cheat in an open relationship when that oh, yeah. communication breaks down. Because oh, yeah? he had a chance to be open with her when she asked, where were you last night? Yep. Mm-hmm. Because for him to say, oh, I was knocked out sleep. It was brilliant for the filmmaker to show the bed empty because yes. <laughs> we know what's up. <laughs> we mm-hmm. know he's out creeping around and... It's really sad because it's another piece that makes me feel bad for Helen because yes. it's something that you would expect your partner of all people to be there for you through something like this. And granted, when <laughs> I know we're going to get to it, oh. but if I would have came in and my partner you know, <laughs> was saying he's in the house and, you know, like there's a, a slain body in front of me, like. It's a little hard. I don't know. But he was he he was philandering before that, so I don't know. Oh, yeah, sure. for yeah. sure. But it's like she was in the institution for a month before he had that girl moved in there. And she was painting the walls that hideous color. Oh, oh my God. Pepto-Bismol pink? What I was like, is that fuck? mauve? Mauve? Like, what is that? Oh, that Upsetting. is not mauve. That's what it no. was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but Jesus. I do love that girl's reactions to everything Virginia Madsen does. <laughs> oh, too. yeah. No, that's fantastic. Sorry, I've got mm. her name here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh i know <laughs> anyway carolyn lowry as stacy yes everything she's doing because basically all she does is react she has like virtually no lines at all yes yeah okay so we have jumped ahead but <sighs> should we talk about poor bernadette and i mean trace i think you cued me that you found the scene where Candyman comes through the mirror very successful yeah i, I think it's the best scare in the movie and apparently they actually did not tell her that was going to happen. Oh, uh, and Tony Todd wasn't going to do it. He was like, I'm not going to actually scare her. And they, like, coaxed him into it. Ugh. But apparently when his hook comes to the medicine cabinet, like, Virginia Madsen, like, literally like, ran off the stage to the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> um, I-, I love this. I think it's a fantastic scare. But, um, yeah, I think we owe it to poor Bernadette. Like, in Casey Lemons, like, I mean, I like watching her. And, of course, she's become a very, like, renowned director now. Yeah. Mm. But, yeah, this poor character, A, she doesn't even say Candyman's name in the mirror five times. Like, she stops. And she walks in and gets murdered just because her white friend (laughs) is stupid. (laughs) Yeah. And when they did her body, Mm. I don't know. Is it a bad makeup job or is it just me? Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. She's like blue-gray. She looked like the corpse bride. Did we have white makeup artists trying to do this? Because it looks fucking awful. No, because I always think about that. Because in RuPaul, whenever like uh, they do the challenge on Drag Race, whenever it's like, oh, like queens do each other's makeup, and you have a white queen and a black queen, yes. and, like the white queen does not know how to do the black queen's makeup. Mm-hmm. That's how this felt to me. <laughs> yeah. It was very that, and it's such a it's such a disappointment because the gore aspect, like everything below, looked mm-hmm. very good. Even yes. by t- like even today, like rewatching it. I'm like, stands up. But that blue, it yeah. just, it's not, uh, it's upsetting. I mean, they were like, what happens to black skin when it dies? Oh, it's, bl- it's blue. <laughs> Very blue. <laughs> it reminded me of like bad depictions of Haitian zombie movies from like back in the 50s and 60s. Like, it almost looks like, oh, if you put this in black and white, it would look fine. You're like, but this is color, bitch. Right. Yeah, we <laughs> see the color. Yeah, I, okay, I, I'm glad that y'all thought the same thing, because I really wasn't sure. <laughs> it takes me out every time. It, it's just that noticeable, right? And I think sometimes you're like, it, something isn't right, but I don't know exactly what. And then, yeah, the last couple of times I've watched it, I'm like, oh, it's a bad makeup. Well, that may be why they... I mean, because it's like one shot they don't that linger, they show no. But, but Casey Lemons was like, oh, I was on the ground all day. And I wonder if they had maybe more footage of it and they realized how bad the makeup job was. <laughs> Quite possibly. Honestly, Casey Lemon's like a fantastic actress, thanklessly used in iconic horror movies in like the first two years of the 90s, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, at least she doesn't die. In yeah, she doesn't die. Lambs, but she also gets <laughs> fuck all to do. Well, she supports Clarice. Oh, oh, good. A black friend to support a white woman. 
<laughs> How novel. I've never seen that before. I mean, she was just missing the obligatory, are you okay? <laughs> that, that was the only thing that was missing. <laughs> oh my God. Watching Rachel True do that, like, yes. I have played so many white women's best friends and had to say, are, are you, you okay? okay? <laughs> now, did y'all read, though, that Virginia Madsen was actually cast in the part of Bernadette and Bernard Rose's wife was going to play Helen, mm-hmm. but the twist of fate so of course they were like no we're gonna make bernadette black so they couldn't have virginia madsen but then bernard rose's wife got pregnant and she couldn't be helen and so she said oh it should go to virginia yeah it's very interesting i'm intrigued by when the decision to make bernadette black happened yes I mean, obviously, they had the NAACP meeting after the film was made, but mm. I wonder if they were kind of like, oh, this no. doesn't look great. I think the NAACP meeting was before, because it said they read the script. They, read they the didn't script. see the movie. Interesting. I wonder if that was a change to be like, let's get another black character in here who is not living in the housing project, quote unquote, more eloquent. and. <laughs> I just think that, to me, is the biggest distinction. Like, when Bernadette speaks, she speaks like Helen. And then when you go and you hear, like, even Anne-Marie talk, it's very white person says a bonics. It's one of those things, though, where it's like, okay, you know, it's 1992. And listeners, I mean, you know, we're obviously, like, lobbying critiques at this film. But as we've all said, we all like this film a lot or love it in some cases. of course. This is where, like, dialogue comes in, right? It's something Joe and I have definitely done when we're talking about queer films that are, I mean, pre-2010. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Where we're like, oh, it was 2009. Like, it was a different time It was back a different then. era. We were all babies. <laughs> Amen. Because in y'all episode, Talk About Signs of the Lambs, like, I was learning shit. And I was embarrassed to admit that. At, like, at 30, 31. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, because, like, it's just, there's certain things that fly mm-hmm. back then or that you're just not thinking about. Yeah. And then you you look back as you, you're older and you're learning. You're like, oh, choices. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Choices. <laughs> Candyman 2021. We'll see what you got. <laughs> and this is the thing, right? I'm so interested to see the new film and then be able to watch how it engages in a discussion with the 1992 film. Because I don't just think it's going to be a better version of what the original was trying to say but i actually think it's going to provide that kind of like through line yeah this i agree just me saying the same thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> Fucking hell. yes yes and. yes and thank you let's <laughs> let's move on uh what do we think of the institutional scenes where she's locked up and we've got tony todd floating above her and then we see the footage and he's not there those scenes make me very upset because mm. Instantly, you know that they're going to try to spin it like this is all happening in her head. And Mm -hmm. you know that there is something supernatural going on. Well, likely. I'll say likely. Because the film is done in such a way where it could be that Helen is... Like, she's an unreliable narrator. Like, it's it's filmed like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, my issue is that I never disbelieve the main character if they say that they're being haunted if they say they're seeing things if they say something terrible is happening i'm like yes it absolutely is so i always go along with everything this movie is doing until we get to the scene with the doctor who is like just another piece of shit like i love that academics in this movie academics and doctors and figures of authority in general all pieces of shit Mm -hmm. and this dude is so fucking smug when he is showing her that video like ah look at you what a good actress you are there's nobody there you're a mental yeah it was terrible the appearance of Candyman in this scene though is great because i remember the first time i saw this even you know back then not liking it this um (laughs) i did not expect him to just show up and gut this man yeah, and, and this is that moment of catharsis where Helen literally calls him Black Mirror style. She looks into the darkened screen and says, okay, I'm going to use this reflective surface. Calls Candyman to prove that she actually believes. But it's also her activating this white privilege where she's like, oh, well, I'm not going to be able to get out of this. So I'm just going to call on this black dude, like service industry style. Hey, can you get me out of these straps and kill this dude? Waiter! No, Waiter! I'm not, no, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> if I was, I'm not gonna lie to y'all. <laughs> if I was in that situation, 
Oh yeah, I would have hit Candyman doing a couple thing. times, <laughs> and it would have came again when I when I show up at the house and that Pepto Bismol oh, right. color is going up. I would have yes. called right there. I, I would have yeah, definitely like, been. You're going down, and you're going down, and fuck you, girl who cut in front of me at the grocery <laughs> store. You're going down. Okay, but okay. So first of all, the the smart play here would have been to invite a room of people in to this room <laughs> to, to, before she called Candyman. <laughs> right. But but also, y'all realize that what y'all are suggesting is now turning in a former slave into a current slave, as he is now murdering at her whim. <laughs> I mean, that is very true. <laughs> Okay, so in my defense, I am literally referencing Briefle and the guy. They say Candyman is thus trapped in the same subservient position as the ex-slave's son in the professor's narrative. He is the black man for hire at the beck and call of consumers in a service economy. There you go. I was right. <laughs> but, but yes, <laughs> also... <laughs> But yes, no, um, th- th- this whole exchange between, I mean, it's a moment of levity and almost comedy in yes. this movie. It's just very cathartic. Oh, yeah. I, I think the way that Dr. Burke is dispatched and then the reactions that uh, Stacy has when Helen finally arrives home, that's all comedy for me. And then really at that point, it's like, oh, Helen's life is over. She accepts it. And we're into the climax. Yeah. So she shows up at Candyman's church. I do love the production design, particularly the way that Bernard Rose shoots this. So like we're constantly looking through gaps in the walls as she's like climbing up that staircase into his pseudo quasi church. And ah, it's dirty, but it's so gorgeous. It was apparently like four stories tall or something ridiculous. Wow. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. And then we get the pseudo sex scene. I mean, do y'all want to talk about the bees? <laughs> <laughs> talk to us about the bees. So I don't really have a lot to say, except for um, I'm going to name drop a movie that I have referenced here before. But um, the man who controlled the bees, the bee wrangler of sorts, his name was Norman Gary. And he had previously handled bees on such films as The Deadly Bees from 1966, My Girl from 1991, and everyone's favorite cannibalism movie, Fried Green Tomatoes. <laughs> oh my i love that the lizzie mcguire movie has stepped aside so yeah, the it's fried, fried green tomatoes. tomatoes has taken the mantle what did i talk what episode did i talk about it on oh oh it was daniel isn't real yes. um <laughs> at least this one has a connection this doesn't have a connection yet because because uh, uh mary stewart bastion is a b person whatever you call it <laughs> in fried green tomatoes but um no Candyman used more than two hundred thousand real life honeybees throughout and uh, most of the crew wore body suits but what i found so interesting is that um so bees apparently get their stinger when they're 24 hours old right. so they were breeding the bees and they had to use bees when they were shooting that were 12 hours old that being said tony todd still got sung about 23 times but he had a a, a clause in his contract that he would get a thousand dollars for every bee sting which I love. Get that fucking money. Hell yeah. But listen to them talk about the bees in his mouth. Like, basically, the Wrangler was like, there's not really anything we can do other than just scoop them and shove them in your mouth. And he was like, all right, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> but it wasn't like a fast process. Didn't it take like an hour or something for them to stuff all those bees in his mouth? Yeah, oh it's like it took about half an hour to get them all in his mouth. And he he said that he was like tranced out doing it because he had a mouthpiece in his mouth. So it wasn't just his bare mouth. But I mean, there were still pieces of skin in his mouth that were like exposed. But he would have to like sit there and hold his mouth shut like full of bees before like the shot was like before action was called. Absolutely not. I, I could I could not do it. And I, I, I don't think anything like this had ever been done before. Sounds terrifying, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like it can go wrong, too, but, I mean, because he was able to sacrifice so much and make those deals so he gets paid for the sacrifice, which I think is brilliant, Mm -hmm. we did get some of the most memorable scenes out of horror for that time. I mean, just generally speaking, like, the mouth full of bees is... Uh, so good. It's so good. Yeah. And this was the the Bravo's scariest movie moment. Like, this was the moment. Oh, really? I can see it. I can see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. They got really loose with um, scariest. A lot of times it was most iconic scene in said film, but they still right. called it the scariest movie moment. Eh, fair. Fair. <laughs> so, yeah, then we get to the end, which is basically that she realizes that baby Anthony, Anne Marie's son, who has been missing for most of this movie, is actually inside of this giant Les Miserables barricade. <laughs> oh. 
this this ending, I I I do remember being really angry with this ending because I was I don't think I really understood it. I was kind of like, wait, like he told her he was gonna give her this, so he just lies to her. He fucking lies to her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's basically like, people need to. 